I don't know about you, but I find one of the most enjoyable aspects of the holiday season is the Christmas lights. Anyone else enjoy the Christmas lights? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, anybody else drive around just looking at the houses that are decorated? You do some of that? Maybe take the kids or the grandkids? Yeah. And, and when we do, you know, we find some beautiful houses, don't we? I mean, some people really work hard, beautifying, adorning their, their place, uh, their residence. Very attractive. And, and then, of course, there's other examples where some people just don't know where to quit, right? <laughs> and you look at it and you say, well, that's a little over the top, you know? I mean, I guess if you want to be seen from outer space, that's one thing, right? But if you've got to live next to that, eh, maybe not so much. Then there are still others you look at and you say, yeah, nice try. Uh, get a participation trophy, right? Well, maybe not, you know. Sometimes it's just a an epic failure. <laughs> Certainly one of the most enjoyable aspects of the holiday season is the Christmas lights, which kind of makes sense if you stop and think about it. Because lights played a crucial role in that very first Christmas. Remember the angels did a dazzling light show in the sky that sent the shepherds scurrying to Bethlehem in search of baby Jesus. And of course, it was some time later, but still connected to what we think in terms of the Advent season, that the Magi were guided to the Christ child by another bright light in the heavens. And so I guess it should come as no surprise that still today, Christmas is often associated with lights. In fact, I think it's kind of ironic that Christmas falls just four days, we celebrate Christmas just four days after the winter solstice, Right? the longest night of the year. So all this light comes at a good time. It's fitting. When we're in the darkest part of the year, the light of Christmas breaks through. And we're going to see that in John's Gospel this morning. Did you bring a copy of the Word of God with you today? Let's drop anchor back in John chapter 1, shall we? Matthew, Mark, Luke, John fourth book into the New Testament. If you get to Acts, Romans, and those other guys, come on back, right? John chapter 1. Let me just give you a, a quick recap. It was a week ago, last Sunday, we began a study of the first 18 verses of John chapter 1. It's a series I'm calling Recapturing the Wonder of Christmas. And it's true, uh, this section does not contain the traditional Christmas story. Nevertheless, it does give us some key insights into the person and work of the Messiah. And so, for example, we learned last week, we discovered the wonder of the God who came near. John doesn't beat around the bush. He, he goes straight for the jugular. And so he begins in those first three verses by describing Jesus to us, the one he calls the Word or the Logos in the Greek, the one who is eternal. John tells us he's the one who is eternal, the one who is who has created all things, and the one who is, in fact, equal with God the Father. Jesus is truly God. And today he's going to follow up on those insights by introducing us to the wonder of the light that has come. In one sense, the prologue, these first 18 verses of chapter 1, are, are somewhat of a miniature gospel of John. I say that because almost every major theme that one reads about in the rest of the gospel is found here in these opening verses. Isn't that interesting? And two of them that uh, figure prominently in the passage today, the passage that we'll be studying today, are light and life. And you'll see that. In fact, if you'd like to mark up your Bibles, you might want to go through and circle the word light every time it appears in verses 4 through 9. I found seven in the in 1984 NIV, seven in six verse, seven times in six verses, John uses the word light, phos, in, in, in the original, and twice in this text, he employs the term life. At some point this Advent season, I'm sure we're going to sing it, hail the heaven-born Prince of Peace, hail the Son of Righteousness, and the hymn writer put light and life. 
to all he brings. Why did he do that? Well, right here first in, in John chapter 1, verse 4. If you're following along in the outline today, we make those available as you're entering the building. You can fill in the blanks, jot down additional references. Three certainties I'd like to focus on regarding this light today. Three certainties that John unpacks for us here. The first one being this, certainty number one, we desperately need God's light. Much as we saw last week in his use of the phrase, in the beginning, John 1.1, 1, 1, here again, John is making a correlation to the Genesis account. Check it out. Go back to Genesis with me. Genesis 1, verses 1 and 2. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the, first, the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Can you see it there? Genesis 1 tells us that darkness came first, right? Now look at verse 3. Genesis 1, verse 3, and God said, let there be light. And there was light. So the first act of creation was to answer the darkness with light. Now here in similar fashion, John chapter 1, God responds to the darkness of our existence by sending Jesus to the light of the world. Pick it up at verse 4. In him was life. And that life was the light of all men. The light shines in the darkness. I'm guessing it's not necessary for me to spend a lot of time here today. But let's just go on record. Here's the reality. Apart from the light of Jesus, our world is incredibly dark. Have you noticed that? <laughs> I'm guessing you have. That darkness is obvious in the, in the rampant and flagrant crime in our major cities. Retailers nationwide are going under and shutting their doors because of a $100 billion shoplifting epidemic. It's gotten so bad in cities like Washington, D.C. that almost everything is locked behind plexiglass. The darkness is also evident in the atrocities that were committed in recent weeks by Hamas one could hardly believe that a human mind could even conceive, let alone carry out, such brutal and hideous acts against other human beings. I mean, it's like it just boggles the mind, does it not? But they not only committed those acts, but then openly celebrated after doing so. That darkness is obvious in the distorted thought patterns of so many of our youth. I'm guessing you saw this. In just the past couple of weeks, a new trend went viral on TikTok where American teams were reading the manifesto of 9-11, 9-11 mastermind Osama bin Laden, calling it mind-blowing and eye-opening. In other words, they were not only sympathetic towards him and supportive of his efforts, but in some cases, even praising him. According to these young American teens, bin Laden was justified in killing over 3,000 Americans. We deserved everything we got. I could give you many other examples, but I'm sure you're picking up on it here. You ever wake up in the morning and think, am I living in bizarro world? I mean, like, every, every positive value has been flipped on its head. How, how did this happen? Centuries ago, uh, the prophet Isaiah warned, didn't he? He said, woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness. And we're seeing that, aren't we? And not only are we, are we engulfed in darkness, but then the, the darkness seems to be intensifying. Now, John actually explains the reason why a couple of chapters later. If we stick in John's gospel, go over to chapter 3, look what he wrote there. He said, this is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but men love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Pretty well summarizes it, doesn't it? Men love darkness because their deeds are evil. We reject the light because when it comes right down to it, in so many cases, we prefer darkness. We have a, we have a bent towards sin, towards evil. And so the sad commentary on our human condition is this. Left to ourselves, left to our own human instincts, we ultimately implode. Such is the waywardness of human nature. Man is a sinner. We are, we are desper desperately depraved and hopelessly lost. And you don't have to be a believer 
to sense that darkness. Look at this. British, uh, British philosopher, mathematician Bertrand Russell wrote a book way back in 1927. It was a book entitled, Why I'm Not a Christian. And in that book, he expounded upon the darkness of human life. Look what he wrote. He said, if there's no God, or if we can't know there is a God, then consider the logic of your position. If there's no God, then we're an accident. We're just chance creatures. We're, we're the result of an accidental collision of molecules. And unfortunately, and tragically, we've evolved into creatures with self-consciousness. In other words, we're aware of ourselves. We have the ability to reason. And because we're aware of ourselves, we feel like we're more significant, more noble somehow than rocks and slime. But there's really no reason. There's no basis for such a feeling. Are you following what he's saying there? If you take God out of the equation, then that's what we're left with. We descended from pond scum. We might feel like we're more important because of our self-awareness, but, but don't let that go to your head because the reality is we're not. If you take God out of the equation, that's, that's what we're left with. All of mankind will die in the great death of the universe. All we're left with is darkness. So Merry Christmas to you. <laughs> go ahead and have another cup of eggnog and sing Frosty the Snowman, right? It's all meaningless. We desperately need the light and the hope that it can offer. That brings us to certainty number two. Praise God, he dispatched the true light. He sent the light. Thankfully, God answered the darkness with light. Verse 5. The light shines in the darkness. I've already mentioned the, the fact that that term light is a popular one in John's writing, seven times in six verses. But you should be aware that it appears over 30 times throughout the entire gospel. And so, for example, uh, we could go over to John chapter 9, verse 5, where Jesus himself asserted, while, I am, while I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. And that, of course, lines up with the very nature of God. If we go over to John's first letter, so this would be 1 John chapter 1, verse 5, we read there, God is light. The very nature of God is light, purity, holiness, and in him there is not a tinge of darkness. There is no darkness at all. In similar fashion, the prophet Isaiah had predicted that when the Christ would come, he would bring the light we need. Remember Isaiah 9? The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. So here it is in verse 5. The, the light that Isaiah is referring to actually occurred. Verse 5, the light shines in the darkness. And, and, and the verb for shine there in the original language is actually in the Greek present tense. And that gives us the liberty, the freedom to translate with ongoing continuous action. So you could rightly translate here, the light keeps on shining. The, the, the light continuously, continuously shines in the darkness. The idea here is that the light is in action consistently. The light and message of Jesus are, are still reaching out to mankind today, reaching out to us today. But it gets even better than that. Look how verse 5 ends. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. That's how the 1984 NIV translates. But that term for understood can mean the darkness did not comprehend or grasp the light, but it can also mean, as the Living Bible translates, it could not extinguish it. Or the 2011 NIV, and the darkness has not overcome it. And I actually prefer that rendering. You see, gang, in this ongoing struggle between darkness and light, it may seem at times that the darkness is so great that there is no hope. But the bottom line this morning is the light will prevail. The light will overcome. Darkness will never be able to stamp out the light no matter how hard it tries. It cannot extinguish it. Look at verse 9. The true light that gives light to every man was coming into the world. That expression, the true light, what, is, what does it imply? 
implies that there are, there are false lights, right? True light over against counterfeit lights. In other words, there are other messages, there are other messengers that mankind has promoted as solutions to our darkness, solutions that on the surface can sound appealing, solutions that can sound inviting, and yet they all come up empty. I'll give you one example. This Friday, December 8th, will mark the 43rd anniversary of John Lennon's tragic and untimely death. John Lennon, the former Beatle, perhaps best remembered for his 1971 utopian anthem, Imagine. The song promoted a, a humanistic idealism that encouraged everyone, just, just work together. Let's come together and we'll, we'll create the best world possible for ourselves and our fellow mankind. Remember how those lyrics went? Here's just a, a short excerpt. Imagine there's no countries. It isn't hard to do. Nothing to kill or die for and no religion to. Imagine all the people living lives in peace. Living life in peace. Lovely, right? Lovely. Only problem is it's not realistic. We can imagine all we'd like. But the cold reality is that this world is polluted with the effects of sin. That much was, was ironically yet graphically portrayed in the action of Mark David Chapman when he snuffed out Lennon's life. No, no matter how hard we try, it's not going to get better just by imagining. It's not going to get better by simply through our collective efforts, working, working, cooperating with each other. We need a solution from outside ourselves. We need somebody to rescue us. And God provided that in the person of his son, Jesus Christ. But even more tragic than his untimely death is that from every indication, John Lennon never embraced that light. He once made this statement. He said, Christianity will go. It will vanish and shrink. I needn't argue about that. I'm right, and I will be proved right. We, the Beatles, are more popular than Jesus now. I don't know which will go first, rock and roll or Christianity. Now, Lennon later apologized for that statement. He said, he said his remarks had been misinterpreted. But here's the point. Maybe, maybe John wasn't sure which would go first, rock and roll or Christianity, but I can tell you today on the authority of God's word that the light came and the light's still shining and the darkness will never be able to overcome it. Amen? Amen. We desperately need the light. God in his goodness dispatched the true light to us. Certainty number three, the decision to walk in the light will lead us to life. Let's go back to verse 4. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. There's the other key term in this section, life. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's very popular, again, in John's writings. It appears a total of 36 times throughout this book. The Greek word here is zoe, almost always used in, in the New Testament in reference to eternal life. The Greeks had another word for natural life, suke. Human beings are born with natural life. We are born with suke, but we don't possess eternal life. We don't possess zo zoe. That can only be received by believing in the one who possesses the zoe, none other than Jesus himself. And a thorough study of John's gospel would, re would reveal that there's, there's a continuous association of life with, with the logos. Look at John 10. In John 10, 10, Jesus said that he came that men might have life, Zoe, and, and have it to the full. In those familiar words in John 3, 16, he died that men might have everlasting life. In John 5, 40, only those who come to him are guaranteed life. In John 10, 18, he claimed that he had the power to lay down his life and then to take it up again. In John chapter 11, as the Lord of life, he raised Lazarus from the dead, and twice, in, in no uncertain terms, he said, I am the life. 
In that, in that context of, of John 11, the raising of Lazarus, he said, I am the resurrection and the life. And then, of course, in John 14, 6, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So over and over again, you see this, this close coronation between the logos and life. Make no mistake about it, gang. Life is a gift from God, isn't it? I've had the privilege of witnessing the miraculous arrival of all three of my children. I was there in the room as they made their grand entrance into this world. And every time I walked away convinced that life is the direct design of a divine being. It's no accident. It didn't just happen. I've also stood by and helplessly watched at the other end of the spectrum. I've watched as the monitor in the intensive care unit indicates the steady decline of vital signs. And there's nothing that you can do. There's nothing that you can do to, to prevent the life of your loved one from slipping away. Life. Just what is it about life anyway? But what is it about life that causes the unborn fetus to instinctively move away from the abortionist cold, sterile instruments of death? What is it about life that causes some folks to, to exercise regularly and watch their diet and take vitamins and get an annual checkup, all in hopes of adding a few more years to their earthly existence? What is it about life that causes the body's immune system to automatically go to war on any bacteria or virus that threatens our health? I'll tell you what I think it is. I believe we're hardwired for life. That's the way the, the Almighty created us in the beginning. We're not merely grown-up germs that resulted from a chance collision of spontaneous chemicals. Scripture tells us, and back in Genesis 1, God created man in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he, cre he created them. Now, stop and think about that for just a second. As humans, we reflect the character of the ultimate life source in the universe. We were created in the very image of God. And because of that, all human life bears his divine stamp. Life is sacred. Life is a gift from the creator. He and he alone sets the boundaries of when we live and when we die. Is it any wonder then that we grasp and, and claw and struggle and fight right up to the last second just to hold on to this precious gift called life? But not just life in the here and now, not just transitory life, but eternal life. Deep down, we want to live forever. You sense that, don't you? Deep down, we want to live forever, and that's precisely why Jesus came. Verse, verse 9, one more time, especially that middle clause, the true light that gives light to every man was coming into the world. The light that Jesus brought to our sin-plagued existence is accessible to every person on this planet. His truth continues, continues to shine and reach out to us today. The question is, what will we do with that light? How will, we, how will we respond to it? Look at John chapter 8, verse 12. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. You see why this third point says the decision to walk in the light leads to life? That's what Jesus is telling us there, isn't he? Or again, we could go over to John chapter 12, verse 36, where Jesus said, put your trust in the light. Put your faith in the light while you have it so that you may become children of light. I'm going to shoot as straight as I possibly can with you today. You cannot accept the, the good news of the gospel until you first accept the bad news. And the bad news is every one of us is a sinner. Every one of us is in desperate need of a Savior. The light of Jesus exposes, exposes us for what we really are. There, there's not a one of us that has attained to God's standard of perfection, right? Romans 3.23, we've all fallen short. And Romans also makes it clear the penalty for that sin. 
The penalty for those sins is eternal death. If we don't do something about our sin problem, we will be eternally separated from our holy God. I know that's not what we like to hear, but it's the truth. And that's precisely what makes this passage so exciting. Jesus came to show us the way out of darkness. I think a metaphor from, from Dietrich Bonhoeffer may be helpful here. Bonhoeffer, of course, was the Lutheran pastor who was arrested during World War II because of his resistance to Hitler's regime. In a letter dated November 21st, 1943, Bonhoeffer wrote these words. He said, life in, pri- life in a prison cell may, be, may well be compared to Advent. Let me, let me give that another shot. Life in a prison cell may well be compared to Advent. One waits, hopes, and does this, that, or the other thing, things that are of really no consequence. The door is shut and can only be opened from the outside. What an accurate portrayal of our predicament. Before Jesus came, there was only a sliver of light entering the prison cell through the bottom of the door. We were living in total darkness without possibility of escape. But then one day, Christmas Day, that door was open from the outside. Jesus came to the cell, it flooded with light. He lived among those dwelling in their darkness. He told them about a new world that was outside, a new world that they could experience if they would just follow him out that door. Some listened and trusted him, but others resisted. They had grown so used to the darkness that they were content with it. They'd become so accustomed to their prison cell existence that they couldn't, they couldn't possibly imagine how anything could be better outside, how anything better awaited them. Look how Jesus' ministry is described in Isaiah 42. God says, I will make you, Jesus, a light for the Gentiles to open the eyes that are blind, to free captives from prison, and to release from the dungeon those who sit in darkness. Here's the good news this morning, gang. Because of Christmas, because Jesus came, you don't have to stay in the dark any longer. The prison door has been opened. Now you have to make the conscious choice to put your trust in the light, to put your faith in the light, to step out of that prison cell and follow him. It would be wrong for me to wrap up this morning. It would be wrong for me to wrap up without giving you an opportunity to respond to that truth. I don't know where you're at, where you are at in your walk and relationship with Christ. But as we've already emphasized this morning, it really is a choice. It's putting your trust in the light, putting your faith in Jesus that he is everything he claimed to be, and he's our only hope when it comes to being saved. If you've never taken that step of faith, if you've never made that commitment, I want to give you an opportunity to do that today. In fact, let's go ahead and bow our heads right now if we could. And if you're in a place where you recognize your need and you want to make that choice or that decision today, I'm going to lead you in a prayer. And all you need to do is pray silently while I pray audibly. Just echo these sentiments from your heart. Do it sincerely. Say, me too, Jesus. You, you pray this prayer. Express it to God right now. Jesus, thank you for bringing the light. I'm weary of existing in the darkness. I recognize that I'm a sinner in need of your salvation. Thank you for coming to this world. Thank you for living the perfect life. Thank you for dying in my place and taking the punishment that I deserve. I now put my trust in you. I believe you're everything that you claim to be. And from this point on, I want to follow you. 
I want to walk in that light. I want my life to bring honor and glory to your name. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer this morning, especially for the first time, if you express that from your heart, you really need to let somebody know. So maybe there's somebody here as a trusted friend or a family member. I'd love to hear that news. <laughs> nothing, nothing gives me greater joy than when somebody walks out of here and says, Pastor Gary, I prayed that prayer. And so if that's you today, just even as you're exiting, if you want to tell me that, that would be wonderful. I'll pray with you in, in, over these next days and encourage you in that walk and relationship with Christ. We stand with me. We're going to close the service in prayer this morning. God, I pray over these days as we do a deep dive into John chapter 1 that these ab abstract concepts will, will come to life and to help us pull back the curtain and maybe in a new and a fresh way we'll, we'll embrace Christmas like we never have before. It's, it's not about fluff. It's not about uh, decorations, it's not about parties, it's not about sappy tunes. It's about the, the reality that the God of this universe who created us came to this planet to rescue us from our sins. He brought light into our sin-plagued planet, into our a dark existence. And the world offers many alternatives. The world will, will give us conflicting messages for solutions to that darkness, but ultimately they're going to leave us, that we're going to come up empty. They, they're all going to fall short. It's only the true light, Jesus, that can give us the hope that we need in these days. And so help us, Jesus. I pray that if there's someone within the sound of my voice that have never made that decision, that they would not continue to kick the can down the road. They make that choice to be a Christ follower. For those of us who have, what a message we have. What a season to, to be announcing that and proclaiming it to our world. So help us to do that in our interactions, in our holiday gatherings, that we'd be quick to speak up the difference that Jesus has made. We're a city on a hill. You asked us. You, you commanded us. You are the light of the world. And so now, God, scatter us to take that light. People can see it, detect it and embrace it. Give us those opportunities even this coming week, we pray. We ask in Christ's name. Everybody who agreed said amen. Amen. Have a great week. God bless.